You know, with thousands of stocks, most of what we do in this business is say no. And we have to work hard to find the few times when it makes sense to say yes. You can't look at just what's right now. If there's a change of guidance, a change of expectations, that's multiplied over years. And that, that can result in much higher prices or much lower prices. You can't really kind of block everyone else away. The market's always changing. The economy's going to change. If your goal is, you know, maximizing returns and growth stocks are the place for that. If you don't identify what you're trying to capture specifically, you're always going to be in this environment where you go from thinking that your tool is good to thinking that you're awful. And it's really that you need to understand what you're trying to capture, what environment works for you. Then after just understanding, are we in that right environment? You have to have your tools that you're comfortable with. And then you need to block out a lot of noise. And then it's up to us to separate the hype from reality. Like with every uh, new opportunity, there's going to be a lot of hype and falsehoods. All right, welcome everybody to day four of the 2023 Trailline Trading Conference. Uh, it's my pleasure to kick things off with my good friend, Matt Caruso, uh, the founder of Caruso Insights and also a top performer in the US Investing Championship. Um, always great chatting with Matt and he's such a fantastic teacher about trading and investing concepts. So Matt, thank you so much for taking the time and uh, I'm really looking forward to this. Yeah, it's great to be back here uh, one year later. I even thought I'd kick off with a little bit of a follow-up from last year. And uh, what a great conference you guys put together. So thanks. Thanks again for having me. Yeah, it's a real pleasure. And, and just before you get going, uh, if you guys do enjoy the conference, please go ahead and take the time to leave a like down below, subscribe to the channel, uh, check out all the speakers. And uh, I think, Matt, you'd love some participation as well. So if you have any questions uh, for Matt, uh, drop them in the live chat and we'll have a dedicated Q&A at the very end. Uh, and with that, Matt, the, the floor is all yours. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited for this one. Perfect. Thanks again, Richard. So today I want to kind of tackle this with a, a bit of a different view, kind of to follow on actually a little bit from my presentation of last year, but uh, you know, it's not, a, it's not a required watch. Um, I want to discuss the right time for growth stocks. So it's all about context and environment is the way I kick this off. And I think myself and, and probably most people, but I, I know I definitely fell into this camp was you start investing and you want to know when do I buy? What's the trigger? What do I use? How do I get in? And there's just so much beyond that you know it's just really interesting we get so fixated and and with you know it's the reasonable logical progression say hey i can't make money if i don't buy at the right time but what i've, I've come to realize that you know like everything else there's, there's just a time for things to work and those same tools that will work in some environments won't necessarily work in others so that context is really really key so that's kind of like the uh theme i wanted to go with uh, on today's presentation because i i don't see that too often and i just think it's so critical for success so kind of kicking off with the first slide, this is the slide actually I had last year. So I was discussing last year, uh, this is the S&P 500. Up here is the uh, Bank of America uh, Lynch uh, High Yield Index. And um, I was just showing this very strong relationship between uh, interest rates and the uh, stock market. Now, I specifically picked high yield interest rates, so, so high yield debt. So that's the kind of lower quality debt. Lower quality debt moves similarly to equities, to stocks, because... If you're a lower quality debt, there's a higher chance of, you know, not being paid back. So you really need the company to succeed. Whereas if you're like really pristine debt, top of the heap, you can even get paid back even if the company goes into bankruptcy. So there's a very strong relationship between the two of them. And this is where we left off last year. I kind of had this like red line along the top around, you know, 9%, which has been kind of the area things have gotten to in the recent uh, more significant market corrections. Although 08 was definitely like a, a standout with the financial crisis. And so I want to kind of update that for where we are here. And this kind of black bar is where that last chart left off. And so you can see really where uh, this peaked late last October is where we bought him. So again, a lot of what I try and focus on, because there's so much noise out there, there's a million and one things you can look at, is really like, how do I understand the real mechanics of what the market is? And so I just thought it would be a great example. This doesn't mean that this is easy to predict. Obviously, if you have to know where high yield the index is going to go to know where the S&P is going to go. It's not just simply easy to predict this, but we'll we'll look at tools after on how to kind of a, have a better idea of what's going to come next. But just the important foundational understanding of what really drives the stock market or what are the, what, what are one of the main drivers? And this high yield uh, debt pricing is one of them. And of course, that's a, a whole discussion in and of itself, which you can probably view last year's presentation and other stuff I've spoken about. But just to kind of show that like the mechanics still hold true so although it's been a bit of a, a weird market this past year, I mean, we've had interest rates that we haven't seen for decades and, uh, you know, the Federal Reserve going from QE to QT and all of, the, all of these like, kind of new economic changes, people will say, oh, you know, the market's broken. 
Well, the underlying mechanics are not broken. Doesn't mean it's an easy market, but the underlying mechanics are not broken. It's really just uh, the situation that we're in. Kind of, uh, I, you know, interesting that I used NVIDIA last year, not that I uh, knew it, NVIDIA was gonna be this monster AI leader, but I was just showing how this relationship also is very dominant within even gro uh, specifically growth stocks. And you can see how when the yields start to really rise last year, uh, that's when NVIDIA went to this kind of bear market. So kind of fast forwarding again to this year, this is where we left off on last year's slide. You can see really the ultimately the low in NVIDIA was the peak in high yield debt. And obviously thanks to NVIDIA's kind of um, innovative products and all the rest, this is kind of shot way back, even much faster than general indexes. But the underlying mechanics, again, the sensitivity to the changes of interest rates, especially high yield debt, uh, played a major role in, in calling like the top of the stock and the bottom. So regardless of everything the company was doing, it still had to kind of work within that paradigm of the general flows of the market in general. So the need for context. So this is something like, you know, I, I've, you know, like every other trader, we write things for reminders for ourselves. And this is one I've written for myself. And, you know, with thousands of stocks, most of what we do in this business is say no. And we have to work hard to find the few times when it makes sense to say yes. And that's really true because especially even beyond the thousands of listed stocks, I mean, I think between NASDAQ, NYSE, Amex, or I, don't know, I know north of like 7,000 securities. On top of that, you have to figure you can look at a weekly chart, a daily chart, a five minute chart, an hourly. I mean, there's an endless stream of things to look at. So when do we say yes? We need that context. Without that, we're going to be lost in the sea of markets. And, you know, even my own personal journey, I mean, I've tried all kinds of strategies from, I was a market maker, pro trader, I was a day trader, a swing trader, now a position trader. And, and it's really, you need to build that context around yourself with the kind of business you wanna run. So let's take a look now at Roku. Again, back to the original thought, we need to focus on what are the, you know, the, the, the techniques to buy a stock. What we have here, what I would call a perfect three touch trend line. You can see this trend line was touched three times, absolutely perfectly respected, we close above the trend line. And wow, look at this massive advance. You can see this is the trend line way back here in, in June and this monster move, right? So you say, hey, that trend line and trend lines, you know, are like technical analysis 101. I use it in my work all the time. Most people like novice to the market will say, okay, great. So now I know how to buy stocks. I need to just use those trend lines. So now we say, oh, we got another great three touch trend line. We have one touch, two touch, three touch, four touch, five touch, six touch. This is a real authentic trend line. It's perfectly drawn. And look at this great candle that busts above this trend line. And uh-oh, we have this big, big drop lower. So what happened? I mean, why could that same technique work so well in one environment that led to kind of these like instant profits? And this other environment, we kind of just like popped up two days and rolled over and really fell apart. I mean, from 140, 150, like fell in half within a few months. Kind of the exact opposite outcome from the prior trend line break. So, you know, again, with thousands of trend lines, this is a, this is a vital question. If you're going to use any tool, you have to know, well, why did it work one time, but then it didn't work another time? So I said, let's take a step back. Let's learn a lesson from Walmart. So Walmart failed in Germany. Now, I know this may feel like a big, uh, uh, you know, side, side path here from our main discussion at hand, but I, I just want to give the right context here of what, of kind of how to think about all of this. Because again, all of this, this business is a thought business. So Walmart failed in Germany, uh, like terribly, terribly failed. This is a recent article from you know, May uh, 2023. So now is Walmart a successful company? I know it's not a, a very uh, hard question to answer, but I just want to show the context. Walmart's ranked number one for the ninth year in a row uh, for the amount of revenue that it produced in a year. So it is the global revenue champion with $570 billion of revenue here on the last time for uh, Fortune updated this. So, I mean, this is a monstrously successful company. So what went wrong? So uh, they had a below cost strategy. This is just a, a recap from a, a website that I took uh, that I showed before. Uh, you know, uh, Walmart and German unions were incompatible. Walmart had underestimated the competition. I think some important things, you know, uh, Walmart failed to take into account cultural differences surrounding shopping. So there's just, you know, there's just so much here that Walmart kind of got wrong. But McDonald's seems to be getting it right. You can see McDonald's is, is at all-time highs and is, is really an international brand, unlike Walmart. But take a look at breakfast from places around, from McDonald's, <laughs> McDonald's around the world. This is Costa Rica. This is Turkey. This is Indonesia. This is Saudi Arabia. I mean, whereas Walmart just didn't really account for the cultural differences and, and you know, like the unions and, and the employees and what, 
I mean, McDonald's, Taylor, although it's like a burger joint, right? I mean, it's meat and potatoes and that's what McDonald's does. But when it came down to like key um, options for, for, for uh, customers around the world, they tailor fit their menu. So the key to success is context and environment. You know, if, if Walmart failed by not adapting its strategy for its environment, why would you win by applying a tool with a disregard for context? I mean, we must remember that this is a business. And so we all approach trading and we get lost in the sea of tickers and flashing lights and alarms and trend lines and, and uh, P&L. And we forget that we're operating a business. And so whereas McDonald's really had that focus on context, Walmart kind of missed the mark. And so I, I just thought it was just a perfect example because Walmart has an incredibly successful strategy. I mean, they rolled it out across many countries hyper successful globally in terms of revenue and even with their kind of scale their success i mean you could just think of the amount of money and strategy and plan they have to implement the business when they kind of go anywhere for them to kind of fail um you know business is hard environments are different it's not easy to uh, adapt but if if even they can fail when the environment and the context changes i mean that's just such a critical pillar to success if you're going to be able to work in different environments now the interesting thing about trading, unlike a lot of other businesses, is that the environment that you're operating in is always trading. Like, I mean, Walmart can be dominant, for example. I mean, it's dominant throughout the United States. But, you know, there's some chains that are dominant, like in the South or the Northeast or the Northwest. And, like, they know their customer and, and they just stay in that environment and they operate there. And, and they can kind of almost somewhat block out the world and be successful for a long time in their niche market. Trading, you're not so – you can't really kind of um, – block everyone else away. The market's always changing. The economy's gonna change. Interest rates are gonna change. Companies are gonna change. Uh, investors' attitudes, sentiment is gonna change. That if, that you know impacts general trends, it impacts volatility, it impacts liquidity. And so, so you can't block that out. You can't say, I'm just gonna do one thing and ignore it all. And even if you have only one technique, that technique won't work all the time because the market itself is changing. So you can't kind of block out the world like some companies can. So identifying environment is so critical. You know, it's interesting. Years ago, I was um, I started with uh, my my passion for technical analysis. Um, I'm a past president even of the Canadian Society of Technical Analysts. I have my my chartered market technician designation. I ended up on a, an email thread uh, before the days of like these Discord groups with some of like the, the best of technical analysis, like all the the legends. And I was like really young, and I was like, hey, you know, like instead of focusing on when to buy, what if we just if there was a way to figure out what the trend will be. And I kind of got like, you know, it was almost like a, a smart answer saying, well, if we knew that, we wouldn't have to figure out when to buy. But I, that, that question always kind of, so I was, it was kind of disregarded, like a ridiculous question. But in my mind, it's like, ah, that, you know, it always sat with me. If I could just figure that out, that really changes a lot. And, and I so I think it was wrong for that person to have dismissed that question because I think it's a, a fundamental question that, that sets the stage for when different things are going to be, are going to work. So taking a look now at that same Bank of America uh, uh, ICE Bank of America High Yield Index. And, and down here, I have the NASDAQ Net 52-week high low. So this is a tool that I've come to really depend upon to help me figure out what environment I'm operating in. Now, basically, all you're doing is each day, you're looking at the number of stocks making 52-week highs versus 52-week lows, and you take the net number. So if there's 100 new highs and 20 new 52-week lows, your net is 80. So there's overall, there's more highs. This is really important because there's different measures of breadth. You can look at the advanced decline line and this and that, but like, for example, the advanced decline line or the amount of up volume versus down volume, every single day, um, a stock's going to be up or down. Stock could be up a penny, it counts as up. A stock could be down 10 cents, it counts as down. To make 52-week highs is a specific event. I mean, there has to be a, a buyer who's willing to pay the highest price of the past year. So someone has to have conviction for that to happen. And, you know, there could be a stock that can kind of like advance you know, for three days, half a percent, but then fall 10% in one day. So net, net, the stock is down. But in the advanced decline line, you had three advances in one decline. So I feel that, you know, to really measure actually net progress or net, net declines, I guess you can say, you know, 52 week highs and lows do a better job of really showing how many stocks are really winning. Like they're really advancing, not just up on the day, but making, you know, new 52 week highs versus those making 52 week lows. So, when you kind of put this together and you see this on this chart, so the green bars is when you have more highs than lows, the red bars when you have more lows than highs. I even kind of took off the stock market in this picture just to show that this relationship between when yields are falling. So, you know, 
uh, which is bullish for the market in general, which we looked at at the beginning of this presentation. When yields are falling, you can see you get an environment where more stocks are making 52-week highs. So my focus is growth investing. I've done probably everything under the sun from uh, M&A to spread trading, day trading, you know, I've tried all kinds of stuff. And I've, I've really, over time, my passion has always been growth investing. That's all I do right now. And this is particularly important for growth investing because growth investors, uh, growth stocks really take off in an environment where, you know, people are a little more speculative in nature. They're actually willing to pay 52 week highs for something new. So new highs, new breakouts goes back to kind of the foundational concepts of William O'Neill. Uh, we lost him this year. May he rest in peace. Uh, absolute legend. Whoever hasn't read his book, how to make money in stocks should absolutely run to the store or the website to uh, uh, Amazon buy that. And so I, I said, you know, if I can identify these periods of time where we really have this net progress, I'll just be way ahead of the game. So I, I don't necessarily need to know what the direction is or every single wiggle of this high yield index. You can see there's periods here where, you know, it advances a little bit, but in general, you still have uh, a period where there's more stocks making new highs. So that's really the most important thing for me in real time to make this decision process. Should I be buying or selling is do we have more highs than lows? So typically, if we take even a, a longer term view, this is going back, you know, way back uh, to 2010, as far as I could fit on the chart, because a lot of people will say, like, oh, the recent market is just so unique because of COVID and the Fed and all of that. Well, it's not that. Unique. Again, like, that's why I want to start off with the original um, images of what I spoke about last year to this year. The mechanics, the mechanics of the stock market machine are, are, are consistent. They, they've been working the same. What's a little bit odd about this environment, and because I think we're dealing with a more difficult economic backdrop to kind of really uh, bring inflation under control, is that, and this is a technical analysis concept, where you know most bottoms are an event and most tops are a process. So it takes time for like a, a stock or a market to kind of top out as there's like this, this distribution or this kind of slowdown of the uptrend. Whereas bottoms are usually an event. It's like things, people get scared, there's like a fear, there's a drop, a crash or a hard landing. And we turn around, we turn the corner and we kind of improve. So if you take a look at other periods of time where we had these like spikes in the high yield index, you can see they, they were all accompanied with net lows. I kind of circled the red backdrop uh, is the same backdrop that shows the, the net lows in the bottom. And so you can see all of these spikes, all major spikes that led to market corrections were accompanied by net lows. What's a little bit different and has made this a little more difficult for growth investing this past uh, several, you know, past few months, even though, you know, markets bottomed in October, we've had a lot of sideways chop in the high yield index, whereas other market bottoms have had this kind of steep rollover where we got back into a new uptrend after the peak fear, the peak worry ended. This, this cycle has been a little bit different, but uh, ultimately, if the high yield index does come back to a, a, a more, a, a more normal level, I don't, I don't know if we'll see the lows of, um, you know, the kind of like the top of the last bull market, which was uh, really impacted by abnormal kind of monetary policy. If we got back from this 8.4 that we're at now, when I took this this last chart slide to the 6% range, I mean, there's a lot of downside in yields and that would mean a lot of upside in stocks. Of course, we need inflation to come under control, which hopefully it does. But this really just shows how these net lows have been instrumental in kind of protecting, avoiding this bear market, keeping us, uh, keeping us out of all of this chop Currently, just very recently, we've had, this is not a, a very good zoomed in chart, but we've just turned back into kind of net highs as this high yield index has started to roll over once more. Again, ultimately, we need this to really kind of come lower to get a real big bull market in growth stocks. But this is really identifying the key times when growth stocks are the place to go. Why even focus on growth stocks? Well, they provide the outsized returns. If you're someone who says, I want to make as much money as possible in the market, and that's not everybody's goal. Some people's goal is, I want the best risk adjusted return. Or I just want to make X percent and guarantee my capital. There's many different uh, desires for uh, investors. But if your goal is, you know, maximizing returns and growth stocks are the place for that uh, because as they grow, they have the most upside. And the best time to participate in those is when we have these periods of net highs because that's the net highs are a reflection of falling yields. Falling yields pushes stocks to new 52 week highs. But now I want to say, you know, but great stocks are exempt, right? Right? Everyone will say, like, this stock, five years, they're going to do amazing. Doesn't matter what goes on. Look at what they have. I mean, it's incredible. I mean, this, this stock has to go higher. Well, these are a bunch of stocks. I picked um, kind of like a February 2016. 
and I want to show 12 stocks. And this is IPG uh, Photonics. This is the Trex company, Five Below, Planet Fitness. These are four companies right here. Let's advance a little bit. We have Top Build, uh, Atlassian, uh, Bowsen, NVIDIA. And here we have Lending Tree, Square, Shopify, and uh, Coherent. So you can see these are all the same. Let me go back up a little bit. These are all the same period. These are all one year ending in February of 2016. You can see there's very little action in all of these companies. So, I mean, some of these like Planet Fitness are just rolling off a cliff after their IPO. You can see Trex is, has been much lower over the year. Take a look at Team, he kind of IPO and rolled over. NVIDIA had this big rally, but then kind of fell over. Uh, BZUN is like falling right into the lows. Top build looks awful. Um, take a look at Shopify. What a horrible company. This is just falling right. I would never touch this company, right? Well, let's take a look at what happens next. So clearly a good company would not be held back by anything. This is all one year later. What came next? Well, here's BLD. We went from 28 to 60. Here's BZUN. We went from, I don't know, $5 to 37. At last year, we went from 20 to 30, 36. NVIDIA, we went from, oh, I don't know, we'll call it seven, seven to 40. Uh, IPGP, we went from 85 to 163. Five below, we went from 36 to 54. Planet Fitness from 15 to 24. Trex from 10 to 20. Uh, Lending Tree, we went from 80 to 229. Square from 10 to 28. Shopify, this awful company from 3 to 10. Uh, of course, these are split adjusted. Coherent from 17 to 40. So what changed? Well, this is where that first chart ended. That was that February of 2016. And that, all those stocks were awful because we were in a period where yields were climbing. So as yields are climbing, that's not a conducive environment for growth stocks or for, for most companies, specifically growth stocks. What came next was just this steady stream lower where yields started to fall. And we got into this beautiful uh, pattern of net highs over most of this period of time. So if you would have just looked at all of those stocks and you said, oh, for that whole prior year, I don't, I don't have the whole prior chart here. But, you know, mostly net lows, very few periods to really buy the stock, avoid or be very tactical. And then after the, to the next period of time, you're saying, whoa, I got to be invested in these. You were able to capture substantial gains, yet avoid all the drops. So these were all great companies. I mean, look at Shopify, it went from three to 10. Was that an awful company a couple of weeks prior? No. Did it have all the right fundamentals? Yeah. Did it have, uh, you, know, you know, was it a young company? Was it innovating? Yes. What happened? It had nothing to do with the company context environment. The context and the environment changed. If you were applying like trend line breaks anywhere, like on this downtrend in Shopify, you just kept losing. Even if you're trying to buy these breakouts, they ran up, they rolled back over. Same with Square. If you if you said up here we had oh we have this kind of flat base, buy the breakout. Oh, you get slammed from 13 down to eight. Just uh, an awfully a difficult environment. If you just said oh look at Lending Tree, we have this kind of Double bottom, breakout time, bang, from 130 down to 54. So nothing's working. Then you kind of fast forward a little bit, and you can look at all these charts individually. But then Tree, that same stock that you know that just hurt you with that fake double bottom, well, from 100 to 229. Shop, that stock that gave you fake breakouts from 3 to 10. That context environment is critical. So let's go back to Roku and those trend lines. So what changed? So this is that first uh, kind of trend line break that we had. And you can see... What came next, this first of all took place with a backdrop of net highs. And you can see what came next is this massive advance came on the back of a steady stream of net highs. So there was a couple of small little period right here where we had a little correction very quickly back to net highs and away we went again. And so again, the context in the environment was the difference. Taking a look again at Roku here, you can see we have this trend line break. Uh, the environment context is all wrong. We kind of had this little pop up, rolled right over, uh, and we just kept rolling down a cliff. And you can even see there's a few times, like right here with this little bounce off the lows because there's net highs, but this is just a stock in so much trouble and it was under so much pressure because of net lows. Uh, and it's just been absolutely awful. So how does this fool us? So this, you know, all these questions that, I mean, every new trader, every even experienced trader will ask themselves in periods of drawdown is, you know, this tool doesn't work. Uh, I don't know how the markets work. Then after a good time, you say, oh, this tool is perfect. I'm perfect. Well, I can't, I can't miss or, you know, I was too aggressive at the wrong time. I had, I had, you know, too little stock at the best time. And you're always doing the wrong thing at the wrong time. 
because you're always chasing what just worked. So what just worked was the most recent environment. That, that environment may persist for some more time and may keep going, um, but ultimately that, that may not be the case. So it's not so much that the tool doesn't work, it's that the context is wrong. Now, growth investing is really a subset of the market in general. So, I mean, even recently, um, you know, the NASDAQ has had a really good year. Um, but if you look at different indexes, the Russell 2000 has been awful. The S&P 500 has been, you know, uh, subpar, especially compared to the NASDAQ. And it's really been kind of like these big mega cap stocks that that really uh, contribute to the, the large, uh, if not all the gains and more of the NASDAQ 100. And so th this is a bit of an odd situation. Uh, typically, the indexes reflect better what's going on with the general market. But in this current environment, uh, that hasn't been the case. And growth is a subset of the market. So if you're really focusing on growth in general, your job is not necessarily to kind of just look at the NASDAQ 100, which in most cases, it will provide a good context for what's going on. But you really need to look beyond the NASDAQ 100, like the NASDAQ 100, the S&P, these are also just indicators or, or the indexes. You can use them as indicators or, or, or signposts of what the market's doing. But it won't necessarily always project the environment for growth stocks. And so this is kind of, you know, a whole other kind of complex discussion we can have. But, you know, depending on what you're trying to capture, and again, with thousands of stocks, thousands of opportunities, you need to define what your business is going to be. Just like Walmart failed to define its, you know, its business in Germany, uh, or, or at least adapt it. If you don't identify what you're trying to capture specifically, you're always going to be in this environment where you go from thinking that your tool is good to thinking that it's broken, to thinking that you're great, to thinking that you're awful. And it's really that you need to understand what you're trying to capture, what environment works for you. And then after just understanding, are we in that right environment uh, for what I'm trying to capture? So I think kind of going beyond tools. And again, I, this, I'm not sure I haven't had a chance to see all the other great presenters uh, this weekend. But typically, a lot of presentations revolve around when to buy or when to sell. Uh, and I, I, just, I just felt that it's really important to kind of have an understanding of how Though all of that relies so much on the environment that you're operating in. And, you know, so that, that even if you're outside growth investing, if you're a value investor, well, for someone like Warren Buffett, where let's say he wants to buy deep value and stocks are, are dropping hard, he wants an environment where he sees actually yields kind of skyrocketing and prices coming down. And he'll say like, hey, look, by my model, this company is perfectly healthy. There's nothing wrong with this. So I'm going to take advantage of this moment in time where yields are excessively high because of inflation, which won't persist. And I'm going to buy these value companies. And so an environment that may not be great for a growth stock will be absolutely phenomenal for a value investor. And that's why it's interesting enough when you look at performance statistics, there's some environments that where value investors are top dogs. Other times people will laugh at them, say, ah, value investing is no longer relevant. Growth investing is the way to go. Then, you know, fast forward two years later and the value guys will say, ah, growth investors, they just, they just, you know, monkeys who follow momentum. They have no idea what they're doing. It's value that counts. And at the end of the day, it's the stock value that matters most. And it's this yin and yang between the environment we're in that's rewarding different strategies. So I would love to say that's easy to kind of jump between strategies at the right time. That's incredibly difficult. There's, I think there's a reason why if you look at all the best investors in the world, they're not like one second a growth investor, one second a global macro investor, one second a value investor. This business is so difficult and complex that I think you need to be an absolute specialist in what you do. But I, I think instead of kind of trying to argue the case of, you know, this strategy is better than that strategy, find the strategy that fits your personality, fits your risk tolerance, fits, fits your goals. And then after work really hard and not just trying to understand, you know, when do I buy, but under also what environment, what context do I operate? Whenever you go from passive investing in the market to active investing in the market, you leave the world of being an investor and you enter the world of being an entrepreneur. So by that, I mean, you can no longer look at what the market returns are because if you're an active investor, you're applying a strategy, you're actually applying a business model. That's It's no different from someone saying, you know, I'm going to open up a local bakery. Well, if you're opening up a local bakery, you can't expect to just make the returns of like, you know, US GDP. I mean, you're, you're very specific at how you run that bakery. You have good products. I mean, it's two different worlds. So if you become an active investor, you know, sitting back and saying like, oh, I should have, you know, beat the S&P or the yeah, NASDAQ, you should be destroying the NASDAQ in the right environment. Other times you may underperform. What matters is that you have a strategy that at the end of the day for your, your time and effort, you know, outpaces what would have been passive returns. 
but that that you're really focused on applying your business specifically. So stop driving yourself crazy, uh, trying to figure out the right tool and the right buy point. Understand what is your business. Internalize that with your actual beliefs and what you want to capture and, and all of that. And then understand the right environment that um, will make you execute the best uh, with, with all of this. So how do you really win a trading overall? Again, speaking of a business and entrepreneur, I say the same as every other entrepreneur. You need to study. You need persistence, self-belief. You need to take action, take risk, incremental improvement, and relentless relentless work ethic. So, you know, it's interesting. All of these just sound like talking points. Um, but it's almost like as I uh, mature as, as an investor and a trader, and, and, you know, I have other businesses that I'm, I've am i started and I'm working on, it's just each of these points are so critical. I mean, you need to study to build this foundation. Like all the stuff we spoke about today, this took me years to kind of understand and piece together because, again, it's this massive learning curve. So you need to have that study. But there's going to be periods of time where it's going to be hard and you need that persistence you know, to keep working at it. But if you don't have like self-belief, if you don't really think that you can ultimately do it or if you don't really believe in yourself, you won't really have the persistence to kind of get through all of that. And then after there's going to be periods of time where you kind of get scared, markets get rough, your strategy is underperforming. You're going to ask yourself, like, did it really work only because I was in the right place at the right time? So you need to have to always have the ability to take action, take risk, and incremental improvement. This is a business of constantly improving every business is. I mean, what Home Depot offers today is not what Home Depot offered 30 years ago. I mean, the business has evolved and they keep making it better and incremental, but that's how they keep up the competition. And I think relentless work ethic, um, kind of a, as an homage to you know, William O'Neill, who, like I mentioned, passed away recently. Was, I think everyone knows him. If they don't, again, look him up for a legendary investor. He was known for his relentless work ethic. And, and that's something I always try and bring to, to my work. Um, just constant, constantly focused thinking about it. And kind of, especially if you're going to trade for a living, which is what I do, almost like life and, and markets become one and the same. And, and you have to, you're always on your mind and, and just trying to kind of follow this arc of these key traits. Um, I really want to kind of go again above buy points and just the overall most important elements between environment and what it takes to kind of survive the changes of environment. And this is really, it's like every other entrepreneur. Again, when you move from passive investing to active investing, you leave the world of, of being an investor and you enter the world of being an entrepreneur. I think we don't, most people don't uh, acknowledge it. Um, or if they think it for a second, they don't internalize it. I mean, I, I've, I've learned that internalizing something where it's actually part of your core belief and just saying like, oh, I know that are, are two very, very distinct things. And that's something that like a book can't do for you. That's something that, that your persistent application and think a uh, thought process will will do with time. So internalizing these key beliefs, understanding the environment context you have to operate in is what will tie everything together in your system and um, really determine when tools will work, when they won't work, and help you to understand, am I messing up? Am I doing something wrong? Uh, and, and how do I maximize the good times? How do I say, wow, this is the time to really put my foot down? So uh, that's my presentation for today. I'm happy to um, jump into Q&A. Uh, again, this is a real passion of mine. Um, and so, as you can see, this is a, it, it's, it goes beyond just talking points for me. I could really talk about this all day. But uh, anyways, Richard, thanks for having me on. Uh, you can all follow me at Caruso Insights. I'm on Twitter, uh, even YouTube. Uh, so if there's any q and I'm happy to, uh, to answer, Richard. Yeah, Matt. Uh, for, first of all, thank you so much uh, for your presentation. Uh, it always provides a, a different perspective that is extremely helpful for people. Um, as I, I've got a few questions of my own, and then we'll go over to uh, the audience. And if you have any questions for Matt, this is the perfect time to leave it in the chat. I see a few great ones already coming in, so make sure you get yours uh, entered. Um, first, Matt, uh, going back to uh, a chart of the current market versus the new highs and, and the mm -hmm. debt as well, if, if you could. Yeah. Uh, so how are, how are you kind of handling the current envir environment? How are you interpreting things? Uh, new hot, new highs are, you know, showing up a little bit. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on kind of uh, where, where you, where we stand right now? So down here, you can see this, uh, the net highs, net lows tool that I use this, this year, I just kind of break out in this bottom panel is just new highs by themselves. So not the net number, just to kind of see how many stocks are actually breaking out uh, just visually for myself, but we could hide that for this discussion. So you can see this is the QQQ, and this is what I think a lot of people are talking about at this current point in time. And, and this had a really nice, strong leg up. But you, you can see, like, whoa, for most of this advance here, uh, you know, we first started getting net lows, let's say February 20th. From this point here, it looks like, whoa, this indicator is broken. But again, you need to know your tools. And like the NASDAQ 100, I think the top five or six stocks are the majority of the index. So, And those have been the ones that have been moving so strongly. If you take a look at 
um, the QQQE, which is an equal weight NASDAQ 100. You can see from when this tool started to go negative, we've been a little more kind of flat. Or if you look at the QQQJ, which is the um, the next the next uh, 100. So there's a NASDAQ 100. This would be like 101 to 200. You can see this, you know, again, my focus is growth. Most growth is not usually, typically in the, the top five biggest companies. Usually there's like, you know, it's, it's smaller, innovative companies. You can see when this kind of turned negative, we've gone nowhere to sideways. So I think um, we're seeing some improvement on the bottom. Uh, hopefully if inflation kind of keep coming down, we may ultimately get that high yield index to really break lower. And so whereas the QQQ looks a little extended, if you kind of look around that growth, again, understanding your environment, what you're focusing on, which for me is really growth, this is really, I mean, like maybe first inning. I mean, if that high yield index really comes off, this has a long way to kind of go to catch up with the QQQ and everything in general. You can see that in other kind of more aggressive, you know, Russell 2000. This has been really sideways since the net lows came in. If you look at, let's say, ARC Innovation, which is known for kind of a higher growth, you see very flat since uh, during that entire net lows period. So I think, again, it comes down to understanding index construction, understanding your tools. In a lot of environments, it's not important because things typically work <laughs> normally, you know, like traditional correlations and all. Uh, but this is, hasn't been normal, and that's caused because of the spike in inflation. So the environment changed, and that's a whole other discussion. But looking at the tool now, what's it reflecting? It's reflecting that, never mind that the top five biggest stocks where there's been a big move there, but stocks in general, growth in general, we're starting to see some strength. You can see stocks like, for example, IoT, which you know had great earnings, these big, fast moves. And you can see suddenly like the more aggressive type of stocks coming into, um, into play. So we'll see ultimately how they work out. But I think the QQQJ is probably the best representation of a little more of a growth spin to uh, the major indexes. And, and you can see that finally after what's been a, a lengthy kind of correction since February, uh, the net highs are starting to kind of show that that's starting to change. And we'll see if that persists. I think a lot will depend on the forward inflation numbers. Yeah, fantastic. And how, how aggressive have you personally been uh, in this environment? Have you been putting on some exposure and, and trying to capitalize on on the, the themes that are working, AI, semiconductors, that type of thing? Or are you still kind of watching and, and looking for the best opportunities? So again, that comes into like, again, how, how you put out your exposure. The way I kind of uh, put my exposure is I, I leg into positions. Uh, it's actually, originally, a lot of the process came from Livermore in his book, Reminiscence of the Stock Operator, where he kind of discusses how he puts on exposure. So I was in cash through, because of the net lows, through most of this period here, which, uh, you know, I have to admit, when you saw the QQQ kind of like running up, was like a little frustrating at one point, especially this last period here where it started to kind of go up. Um, but it's been a, maybe a couple of weeks now. I started to put some exposure on as we first started getting net highs right back here. I started to do some buying. And so I have, I have a good amount of exposure. I'm not on margin yet, but the way I kind of step in is, is I build some exposure when markets kind of pause. Then after, usually as we get a kind of a second push, I end up on margin as, as I see profit, I build cushions, then I add into string. Yeah, perfect. And and how often do you check uh, the net new highs, new lows, and also the, the debt levels? How often do you kind of consider those indicators and take that into account and that, that kind of informs you about the overall context, uh, the overall environment that we're in. So I check it daily. Um, and, and that's why, you know, also I, I, I kind of break out the number of new highs. Um, you know, you can get into kind of more nuances of the indicator. There could be periods of time where, um, for example, I'll, I'll look at, let's say, um, uh, let me see if I can find an example here. Uh, you can see here we had like, for example, like net lows was like one day, uh, this little red bar. And that was really just because like new highs dried up. So if you look at this bottom here, so it wasn't really driven by like massive breakdowns. So like uh, I like to look at the internals. So I, I look day to day. But if, for example, if we get one day of net lows, it's not like, oh my, I need to be in complete cash. It's like you want to look at, you know, it's a warning shot. Uh, that's why I color the background red when we have like three days in a row or more of consecutive days because there's this continual breakdown. Uh, but I think it's important to look at also is it just kind of like a pause in new highs or are you seeing an actual acceleration in new lows? So if you kind of uh, double click this tool, which you can add this to your charts um, for trading to users, because I get this question, if you type in US, uh, US markets, net highs, net lows, you'll see the tool here by Caruso Insights, which you can add to your charts. But you can break this into kind of uh, looking at the highs and lows versus the net number. And if you take a look at, uh, for example, let's say market peaks, uh, you'll see here, interestingly, like, not only do you see kind of like the number of highs like level off as the market starts to sour, 
Uh, but you can see that the number of new lows really starts to pick up. So like before this, the, the actual index breaks down, you can just see the number of new lows, like there's very few stocks making new lows. All of a sudden, whoa, you can see this big breakdown internally. Like by the time the market has first like down date from the peak, you can see the number of new lows that had, you know, uh, accelerated to the highest level in months. So I, I kind of look at the overall nuances of the uh, internals. I'll look at a daily, uh, but also I, I really like bigger picture. So on weekends, I spent, I put extra effort in seeing, you know, what are the general trends? Is, has anything changed in terms of yields? Because during the week, there is a lot of noise. So it's just being sure to never get caught off guard with any big uptrend or downtrend. I mean, I wait for at least three days before I get really worried uh, if there's net lows, right? You know, I want to see at least three days of net highs before I start to get a little more excited to kind of uh, slow my thought process from, you know, bull, bear, bull, bear. You want to kind of try and uh, segregate the actual true trends. Yeah. And and going maybe back to your presentation and, and looking at past, um, you know, trends after bear markets, what, what kind of observations have you made about the net new high, new low index in terms of, you know, it, it seemed to me that it reaches a peak and then it kind of peters off a little bit after that initial burst upwards. What do you hope to see as a trend develops in terms of that indicator? Yeah, I think that's normal. And again, that kind of, uh, so here, let's bring up the actual QQQ for a little more uh, history. So you can see, for example, if we look at the last bear, uh, bull market, and this is uh, pretty, you, you brought up a topic that's consistent with most uh, bull markets, and you'll see divergences at the end. So you can see here, if we kind of blow this up, you'll see that you have, you know, it starts to kind of pick up steam at the beginning of the bull market, you get your peak usually mid-market, and then you start to see these divergences late market. Um, there's going to be rotations within the, the, the bull market. Um, and again, those rotations are going to be driven typically by interest rates. So as any kind of uh, bull market goes on, a real bull market is typically associated with an improving economy. As the economy picks up pace and people get more excited, eventually that leads to inflationary pressures. You know, People are doing more business and buying and selling, and inflation picks up. So as inflation picks up, you start to see rates start to finally rise and we start to get the you know the opposite of what leads to the bull market. You know, the bull market starts when high yields start to drop and the next bull, bear market starts when high yields start to climb. But when that just starts to begin, you know, that sets off a series of winners and losers. So high growth typically in general benefits from falling yields, whereas more cyclical names or energy or you know, with, with bigger current earnings, they benefit from rising interest rates. They're more attractive relative. So that that will offset kind of this um, uh, the highs and lows between industries. So that's why kind of mid cycle is the point where there's maximum participation. At the end of the last bear market, there's some stocks that are still kind of having a hard time with a bad economy. At the end of the bull market, there's some stocks that start to suffer as the Fed starts to raise rates to kind of slow down the economy. And so there's always seems to be that kind of sweet spot in the middle where the economy is improving. Uh, inflation hasn't come up yet. Interest rates haven't started to rise yet. And then everybody has a good old time. Like this is, uh, investors don't realize it, but this is the kind of part of the stock market that everybody loves the most is that like middle part. And uh, the beginning, people tend to be frustrated that they miss it. The end, people tend to get upset that they stay too long. And uh, this is really the fun part. And, and I know we're looking at the COVID bull market, but if you kind of zoom out any uptrend, you can see this is the 2016 to 2018. It starts off, you know, positive you get like the the best grand old time like right here and then as you kind of got the ultimate top it starts to kind of like peter off and then you get into trouble so and that's really a, a recurring theme you can look here 2012 to 2014 you start off with some reasonable strength you get the best the big party and then even as you kind of run into new highs it starts to kind of slow down and you go into a bigger correction so that's really the general arching theme uh, of most uh market trends yeah that, that's that's awesome. Uh, and I think it's a really helpful visual to have this indicator on um, when looking at the market. Um, take, take a step back and maybe this is more, you know, directly applicable to what you talked about last year. But um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on on the Fed and, and that, you know, the overall macro environment and how that's impacting things and maybe where, you know, that how that could impact things in the future, depending on what actions uh, the Fed takes. Yeah, so the Fed's been aggressive. The problem's been inflation. Uh, it, it's been sticky on the services front. So, I mean, inflation, you, you can look at goods. I remember during COVID, there was uh, people were all these jokes on the internet, like uh, of a lumber truck saying like, hey, look how rich that guy is because the wood prices have gone up so much. So that's like, the, there's the commodity side of inflation and there's the services side of inflation. The commodity side tends to level itself off much quicker as mo more supply comes in. You know, buyers will argue, hey, you got a whole lot more wood there. I'm not paying top dollar anymore. But the discussion is a lot harder to have with employees. So employees would come to you and say, hey, look, you know, uh, 
prices have gone up at the store. I don't want a 2% raise. I want a 6% raise, you know, or I'm leaving. And, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a key employee. So you'll say, okay, 6%. Then after you need to raise your prices to consumers because you have to raise your price for employees. And that kicks off a vicious circle. That's really the Fed's worst nightmare. That's like entrenched, that, that's entrenched inflation expectations. And that's, I mean, the, the Federal Reserve has kind of its own Fed speak, which is uh, economic terminology. Um, so for even investors, like my background, my, my undergrad was in economics. So I, I have a little bit more of a experience there. But for those who kind of are not accustomed to hearing Fed speak, it may sound like a lot of gibberish but uh, at times. But really the Fed, their biggest fear with inflation is not even a little spurt in inflation. It's if everyone believes inflation will persist, that alone will make inflation persist because of that kind of vicious cycle I just described. If I ask for a raise, it means higher prices. It means I ask for a raise, it means higher prices. And that's the spiral that took place in the 1970s. And that's um, every Fed chair's um, biggest nightmare. So I think that's why the Fed kind of, when they realized they made like a disastrous call in 2021 about transitory inflation, they, they raised prices here, uh, sorry, interest rates really aggressively. And so... Um, I think in terms of the current environment, if inflation does keep the c- coming down, that would be great. If, if these expectations don't become entrenched, you're seeing the goods prices already dropping, which is a big plus. So now I think if we just start to see like the inflation for services come back down or trend lower, which would mean that it's not becoming entrenched. People are not expecting, you know, constantly higher wages. Or if, they, if most people agree that, oh, that was a COVID related thing and it's over with, I got one raise and I'm done. I'm not going to keep like demanding raises. I think that ultimately that high yield index will start to really come, kind of come lower with, uh, you know, future lower interest rate expectations and we can get a, a really sizable bull market in uh, growth stocks again. That's the big battle. That's why every time there's this like CPI report, you see these massive moves in the stock market because everyone's trying to like figure out like, hey, looking forward, is this going to be entrenched? Do we have to stay higher for longer? And, you know, the Fed staying higher for longer or coming down lower, I mean, that has just massive impacts on the entire rotation like we spoke about. And uh, so that's what we're seeing here. Yeah, that's, that's my general thought process. Yeah, no, that's helpful. Um, and going back to the July time period of 2022, uh, we did see new highs, you know, start to come mm-hmm. in, come in here. And there was a pretty sizable rally there. Can you kind of touch on, you know, your your personal uh, evaluation of that in the moment, how you were taking into account that? Because uh, maybe it fell a little bit early, but we are seeing the new highs come in. What, what were you kind of doing and, and observing at that point? Yeah, so I was actually, uh, so I was long quite a bit of energy and stuff from early of 2022. I saw that kind of bubbling up. And then after uh, with the, you know, the uh, Russian uh, Ukrainian war that like really got prices flying, but there was kind of like a summer calm and, and, you know, people will say like, oh, well, you know, it it didn't persist. So it doesn't work. You know, how could, you know, if I'm just following along, but the thing is the market's a reflection of, of everything else. Like, um, so at this time, things didn't look as bad inflation wise, or maybe, you know, participants believed it was going to level off a little bit sooner. New data comes out, new things change. It's just like, you know, any company, you know, you can have this product that's doing great. And it doesn't mean like, oh, it's a great product. We never have to do anything about it. I mean, things will change. Competitors come out, consumer preferences change. So, I mean, here, inflation data came out to say like, oh, it's, it's worse than we thought. And the Fed started to, you know, also uh, say that. And then we kind of rolled right over. So, you know, ultimately, the, it's not net highs that will cause a bull market. Net highs are, ref, are a reflection of, of what the market is thinking will happen. Now, thankfully, markets trend, economies trend. In general, uh, the Federal Reserve, the entire economic system is built around kind of trying to get this like nice, consistent growth and keeps everybody happy. Everyone feels like they're doing better in life or the economy is growing. And so that's, that's what makes this work in that. The entire system is built on trying to get this trend of you know continued slow growth. Can we get false alarms? Sure. I mean, we had inflation we hadn't seen in, I don't know, 40 years. I mean, I think the bigger picture is, did you make sure you avoided getting absolutely run over and crushed by growth stocks that fell 90%? Yeah. And you can see we had net high, sorry, we had net lows, like right at the peak of the market. So anyone just using any kind of minimal type of guardrails of saying, okay, is this a right environment would have said, this is definitely not a right environment. Even if you participated a bit here, which I did, and then I had to exit here as we got back to net lows. Uh, me, I, I don't remember now if I made a bit or lost a little bit in this period, but it was ends up being because it's kind of like a, a false start. 
It's just something that you, you kind of forget about thanks to your risk management rules or you made a couple of bucks and you just avoid these disastrous drops. That for me, that's the big key. Yeah, I remember I remember doing the pod, the first podcast we ever did with Stan Weinstein right in that November 2021 area. And he, he was talking about you know, very similar things that you're watching the, the, you know, the advanced decline line declining, you know, all, all these indicators, uh, suggesting that, you know, uh, we could be ready for a correction. Obviously we never knew what, what was going to happen, but, uh, it's definitely, definitely something to keep in mind, uh, as we get in later stage of a, of a bull run for sure. Yeah. And I, and I think, you know, um, you have to have your tools that you're comfortable with yep. and then you need to block out a lot of noise because the, at the end of a bull market, if you even say, like, if you even hint, that like never mind being bearish. If you hint like, oh, you know, maybe the gains will slow down a bit, it's like everyone will be like, Oh, what are you crazy? It's a bull market. And after at the end of a, a bear market, if you say like, Oh, you know, maybe it's, the worst is over, like, what are you crazy? Everything's about to fall apart. So you have to really kind of maintain that perspective and kind of use your tools. If you just kind of go with what you hear by most people, I mean, that's why most people in the market don't make money, active traders rather, you know, because they don't have, they, they go by the whims of their emotions and and that they're looking at the most recent environment. So you have to really just, and everyone will have different tools. There's no perfect tool. Again, my tools are geared towards my style of investing, which is growth stocks, which is finding positions and trends. For someone who's, you know, for years, I was a market maker and stuff, and this wasn't a primary consideration. I was looking at different things. Uh, so it's just that, you know, understand your tools for your system. And like what Stan was looking at, again, similar to what I was looking at, was for someone who's looking more at general broad trends and um, right. blocking out the noise. Yeah, perfect. And uh, Michael asked an interesting question, and I was actually thinking along the same lines here. Uh, do you think there's any benefit, uh, maybe not for your style or time frame, but uh, looking at maybe a shorter time period of highs? So th- these are 52-week highs, I believe. But, you know, one month highs, six month highs. Um, do, do you think there's any merit in, in looking down that road, developing such a tool, using that such a tool? Yeah, I, I think if you're uh, shorter term in nature, uh, but, you know, it, it's it's always like kind of the the, the fight between getting like a, a useful signal and noise. noise so whenever you kind of like, yeah, whenever you like shrink your, your time frame, there's going to be, for example, um, let me see if I could find like a quick example here. Um, it could be like an up leg here where, you know, you'll have gotten your, although this was pretty accurate, even just with the net highs of the 52 week highs, but there, you know, there'll be like quick trends, which maybe your tool will capture that this won't. So again, if you're a day trader, you know, or, or whatever it is, it'll be, you know, for example, let's say off of this low right here, maybe it would have turned positive a little bit sooner and, and turned negative a little bit sooner. Uh, that's why you have to just kind of like zero it in for what works for you. For myself, where I'm trying to find kind of more the true trend, Right. Of, of the market trend, I found this works best for me. Yeah, perfect. Um, yeah, I think that's an important reminder. And maybe getting into, you know, a few individual stocks here, um, looking at the, the trend of debt and all of that, how, how does that impact a growth stock? This is kind of what you touched on last year, how, how the overall environment mm-hmm. impacts things. Uh, but, you know, you showed how the market responds and all that. Well, why is that so directly linked? Why are growth stocks so um so correlated with 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 what's going on in the overall environment so like in in financial talk you know growth stock will be called a long duration asset so that just means like you know um okay i won't get too technical terms but most of the earnings of a growth stock are going to happen far out in the future so any any company you know that's really high growth they could say look we're making two cents a share now but if you just stick with us like in six years we're going to make like a dollar fifty a share which is going to be much more so you know, at the end of the day, uh, no one questions what the value of a bond is. Everyone knows mathematically what the value of a bond is because they, I'm going to get this cash flow payment at each date and my cash back on this date. I can do the math based on what the interest rates are. And this is what this bond is worth at this second. For a stock, everyone can't get a, a, a fixed price because no one knows for sure what future earnings are going to be. But one thing is for sure is if I have to wait eight years for my earnings, for that money to come to me as a shareholder. Because as a shareholder, all I get is the earnings per share. I don't get the income. I don't get the cash flow. I get earnings per share. Um, if that's 10 years from now, well, if interest rates are 0%, say, hey, look, I'm, I'm going to get 0% in the bank. So if I wait 10 years to ultimately get ten, you know, $5 a share, it's it's worth it. I'll wait because I, I, I'll have all this upside and, and I'm not getting any money anywhere else. If suddenly interest rates are five percent in the bank like they are now, you say, "Well, oof, I gotta pay on a, I don't know on a hundred thousand dollars 
I got to pay five. I, I lose out on five thousand dollars a year waiting to hope. Then your mindset changes to hopefully get this five dollars a share eight years from now. And so that opportunity cost changes big time when most of your earnings are far into the future. So you can see as as interest rates change, it has a big impact on the cost of waiting. Whereas if let's say a, a company like um, an energy company where it has you know, they have most of their earnings now, for example, well they're less sensitive because like hey I'm getting my my big chunk of payment like this year, next year, and the year after. So even if interest rates go up from you know zero to five. I'm getting money real time. I'm not waiting for some future date far into the future. So that's why growth stocks are, in theory, you know, uh, mostly affected by the change of interest rates. Yeah, that, that's helpful. And for anybody who's curious about that, definitely watch Matt's uh, presentation from last year. I'll, I'll probably link that uh, later on Twitter or something. I think it was really fantastic. Um, diving a little bit deeper and, and kind of picking your fundamental uh, brain, Matt, since you're so good at that. Um, We've seen we've seen a few companies kind of change their guidance and and everything because of you know a, a new catalyst potentially AI kind of switching things up. Um, what what happens when it comes to valuation and how funds look at a potential investment in a growth stock when guidance from the company dramatically increases and surprises everybody on on an earnings report? How do they change their models and how does that impact how they're positioned? Yeah, so every every company is gonna have different models, but of course, like you know. Um... Companies investing in growth stocks are going to have similarities. And we all we all go to the same schools and study the same stuff and look at the same. So there's a lot of similarities, just like growth investors will look at similar tools. So will big funds running similar models. And forward guidance by companies are important because, you know, analysts will have their estimates. Uh, but a company can't just legally say whatever they want. They can't outright lie. I mean, if they think they're really going to have 100 million sales next quarter, they can't say, well, we're going to have 900 million. I mean, they'll be liable for, for uh, improperly uh, representing the facts. So updating guidance is an important thing. It's definitely going to impact the models. Um, but like everything else, ultimately, it, it does have to show up. That, that's why, you know, some people won't understand when a company has a bad earnings report or, or they, they they hit the most recent numbers. They, they beat expectations, but their guidance is a little bit lower and the stock gets creamed. Right. Well, again, everything is is multiplied over many quarters and years. So uh, um, a fund manager will look at this company and say, look, I'm expecting this to grow 25% you know, year over year for the next six years. If the if suddenly the company comes out and says, well, instead of 25%, we're going to only grow 20. But we did really great now, but we're only going to grow 20. Well, now you have to think of compounding. If, if, if now the fund manager has to go back and say, well, oh, instead of 25 year over year, they've already slowed down now, which is supposed to be their best period. Maybe I should estimate only 15% growth. So now if you take 15% year over year for five years from 25, that's a really big difference when you compound that out. And so that's why the stock suddenly bang drops 30%. So similar with raising guidance, you know, a fund will say like, well, I was expecting 15%, but you're telling me what 25 now, 30%, maybe, well, maybe AI is going to be even bigger, 40%. And then these stocks go on to these incredible moves. Now, ultimately, um, if the, if the company can deliver, if you're Apple and this is, you know, 15 years ago, yeah, the company becomes the, the most valuable company in the world and, and it has this, and it retains its value. Other times, reality doesn't hit because there's competition there changes i mean all the all the things that you run into when you're running a business it's never ending and the stock has this massive rally and then oh, things change and then they, they crash they can't sustain their position as market leader look at roku doing great all of a sudden amazon this big behemoth comes in saying you know i want to have fire tv and i want to do prime video and i'm going to compete directly with you well whatever i was penciling in for roku i got to take something away and this great stock that has to come back down to earth and that's why there's these you know, monstrous trends. And then people will kind of sit with them saying, well, it can't be it's such a great company, but investors are looking are five years out. I mean, so uh, you can't look at just what's what's right now. If, if there's a change of guidance, a change of expectations, that's multiplied over years. And that, that can result in much higher prices or much lower prices. Yeah, that, that's super helpful. Uh, there's a good question here in the chat and, and keep them coming, guys. If you have any questions for Matt, this is the time to ask. Um, the question was, uh, please ask Matt about some books that are good for understanding economics and the fundamental side of markets. You know, I, I get that question a lot and I wish I had a good book to refer to because uh, like I did my CFA studies um, and, and and you learn so much like, you know, accounting and, and interest rates and, and how to calculate bond prices and all of that, which uh, some people like their eyes will roll back. But for me, when I was doing that study, I said, whoa, I, I suddenly mathematically saw all these concepts that I kind of intuitively learned. I, I saw mathematically why they work that way, which was a kind of uh, illuminating. 
But if I kind of just point you to how to calculate a bond price, uh, if I give you a say, read this book, you say, what does this have to do with stocks? So like, I haven't seen any really good books that kind of like uh, tie it all together, unfortunately. Um, I started writing a book a while back. It seems to always take more time. <laughs> I hope to kind of have something in there myself. But um, in terms of pointing uh, someone to a book, I've never really kind of uh, had a book I can say is a goal to. Same with economics. Economics is tricky because you kind of end up in economic theory and economists write books in economics for economists. They don't write them economics books for growth investors. So uh, same there. It's kind of like difficult um, to point you to a book. So um, I wish I had a good one to point to, but I don't, unfortunately. I guess you got to take some time away and finish that book. And, yeah, uh, at some point, yeah. Resource. Yeah. Uh, economics yeah. for growth traders. For, for, yeah, two, for, two small yeah. boys at home have kind of uh, slowed down the process a bit, but uh, it's for a good reason. I'm sure, I'm sure. All yeah. right, perfect. There's some good questions coming in here. Uh, Matt, in line of fundamentals, uh, do you feel AI, uh, I, I guess maybe private equity, slightly overheated due to current price? Uh, to short-term guidance um, over value, and maybe that's a PE ratio as well. Uh, does, that, does that question make sense, or should I ask for a rephrase? Uh, well, I mean, like, I, I think he's saying, does it make sense? Like, have yeah. things gone uh, gotten Over overheated? Board. Yeah. It could be. Again, it's like, it's it, it, for sure, there's always going to be stuff that's an overheat, come back to earth. It's like the internet. I mean, I, I, think, I, I think we're really lucky today, actually, that we're seeing this change in technology, because when the internet came around, no one had really seen such a dramatic change of technology so uh you know recently so the if you look at the way the internet kind of built out and use that just as a template there's going to be so many winners and then losers i mean who uses like uh netscape navigator as a browser anymore i mean all, like all the, the early winners are almost all gone palm pilot is gone you know blackberry beat palm pilot apple beat blackberry it's like this, this cycle so it's like, yeah, you know, some things are going to be overheated it's the job of the investor to figure out what's real what isn't uh, if you get it right the returns are unbelievable. So, I mean, for example, look at Cisco. Cisco had routers and switches, which was laid the, like the foundation infrastructure for the internet. Um, they came out in 1990, the IPO. Someone could argue six months later, hey, this is ridiculous. You know, this had a big move up. The internet's, you know, this internet thing everyone's talking about may or may not come about, and I'm going to sell this. Again, you're, what's your time frame? Because Cisco ultimately had 118,000% return in the 1990s. I mean, I think about 118,000% return. Uh, it's not a big leader today. There's other companies that are competing in that sector. But at the time, if you just kind of said like, oh, it's up too much, you missed that. So but again, but look, if you're a short-term investor, it could be in the short term. It's, if you're very leveraged, you're very concentrated, you may need to pull back. But I think ultimately, if AI or the promise of it um, has the potential to, to dramatically change things as much as the internet has, which it could, it very well could, because it's it's... What I like about the concept of AI, unlike, let's say, social media, is that it's a big productivity tool. And whenever something is a productivity tool, a lot of money will flow to it. Companies will invest in it. People will invest in it. Because, hey, if I put $10, I get back 12 Who wouldn't do that if it's, if it's helpful? So um, it's going to be important to understand who the real winners are going to be. It doesn't mean buy NVIDIA today and it's going to go up 118,000%, especially given its market cap. Um, but I think kind of just... It, it, Understanding your perspective, understanding what can be. If AI, never mind just the AI companies who invent AI, there's people who have to build the infrastructure for AI. There's the guys who are going to use AI, who are going to build AI applic specific applications. There's going to be trucking companies who are going to have more efficient operations. There's going to be uh, call center companies who need less people because they have, and that's going to raise their earnings per share. So just like the internet kind of helped everyone, enable everyone to run more streamlined, better operations and raise everyone's earnings per share. AI as a productivity tool, I think, has that potential as well. So if you're like Cisco Systems, where you make yourself this indispensable infrastructure of, of the internet, it's 1990, I mean, yeah, you're going to go up 118,000%. If you built uh, like Pets.com website in 1999, where like you don't really have a business model, you have an awful product and nobody wants to buy it, just because you're on the internet, you're not going to succeed, you're going to go bankrupt. So I think, again, context is really, really important. But I think there's potential there, but and it's up to us to separate the hype from reality. Like with every uh, new opportunity, there's gonna be a lot of hype and, and falsehoods. Uh, so like I kind of going back to the beginning of my presentation, most of what we do is say no, but figuring out when to say yes is, is like the important part. Yeah, great answer. All right, there's some great questions that came in as well. 
uh, first from Modern Growth Inve Investing. Uh, does Matt go deeper into fundamental analysis, like looking at management teams, strategy, innovation, uh, capital allocation, et cetera? Yeah, I do. Uh, so, you know, I run like mostly quantitative screens. You know, there's there's one video by William O'Neill. I, for, I forget now where I saw him say it, but uh, he was talking about like speaking to management teams, you know, and, and Bill... Uh, was a legend. I'm sure he had uh, big, big chunks of stock in these companies. He could have gotten on the call on the phone with any CEO if he wanted to. But it's like he says in the video, you know, at the end of the day, they can tell you whatever they want. I mean, it's got to be in the numbers. I mean, you could have the best product in the world if your sales are not increasing and they're decreasing. You know, you you can only <laughs> explain that for so long. Why is nobody buying your product? So what I like to do is is kind of uh, narrow down my universe of companies that are already executing. And then I have to understand the teams behind them. So, for example, one stock I was looking at recently, uh, Floor and Decor, FND. I can bring this up right here. So I love success stories. I, I particularly love to read about businesses. And the management team of Floor and Decor is from Home Depot. And so the a CEO of Floor and Decor, I believe he's a founder as well, but uh, don't quote me on that. Uh, he was the youngest ever store manager for Home Depot at 22 years old. He had a, he was the end of the store manager in Florida. And that was close to where Bernie Marcus, founder of Home Depot, uh, had his like vacation home. And so he became very close to Bernie Marcus, who again, I mean, billionaire inventor of, of you know, uh, of uh, Home Depot. And he was kind of mentored by him. And now he's gone on to kind of start Floor and Decor and actually competes with Home Depot in a specialty kind of sub product, sub brand. And their plan is to kind of uh, build these new kind of very large stores with very big specialty in, in floor and decor and kind of roll that out across the U.S. much like Home Depot did. So, I mean, what's better than having like a, a product that's in demand, that's growing with a management team that ha that was trained by one of the best entrepreneurs of like the past 20 or 30 years with Home Depot. So when the time is right, I like to dive deeper into them, but I mean, I won't just buy and hold a company because, hey, they got a great management team. Like, it's got to all match up. And so I don't read about everyone's background each day, I, I kind of narrow it down first quantitatively to who's already executing and then, okay, why? And like, oh, you got this great team too. And that just kind of raised my uh, level of alertness to the company. Yeah, perfect. And there's a good question from Scott. Um, excellent session. Thanks, uh, Richard and Matt. In addition to net new highs, new lows and high yield rates, uh, what are some other market metrics that Matt monitors? There's a lot of M's there. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I also look at the advanced decline line for divergences. I'm not a big like divergence guy because they kind of persist for a while, but I do look at that. Um, I also maintain like my lists of growth stocks. Usually I usually have about like 70 to 100. And so how the performance of those are going. So I kind of have like the macro view looking at the top level. And then at the end of the day, it's like the stocks that I'm focusing on need to be working and sustaining themselves too. So I try to have too many tools because kind of similar to like, let's say technical analysis. If you look at, let's say, uh, price oscillators. There's like RSI, there's stochastic, there's percent R, there's CC. I mean, there's like a never ending number of oscillators. So if you kind of put up 20 of these and okay, they all have a buy signal, it doesn't necessarily make it a more powerful signal because they're all kind of just a different variation of the same. So uh, kind of my mantra of looking at things is like, I want a specific tool for guidance on a specific, uh, for a specific reason that I'm looking at. I don't want 10 of them because ultimately you end up with analysis paralysis where like, oh, I have I have 10 breadth indicators and, and seven are saying one, three are saying the others. One of the three is my favorite, but the other seven are positive and you don't know what to do anymore. So it's kind of like I want to have tools that are descriptive for certain purposes. And if there's a, if there's a if they're not if it's not making sense, well, then I'll dive a little deeper into what's up with this current market. But I try and avoid too many indicators on my uh, my screen for that reason. Perfect. Uh, there's a question from Perk here. Uh, why has Matt changed from a day trader to a swing trader? And now he says uh, he's a, more a position trader. So wh why, wh how have you kind of developed your style over time? Yeah, sure. So the first book I ever read was How to Make Money in Stocks by Bill O'Neill, which got me obsessed with markets. But I love the charting section. So then I got into charts. And when you get into a lot of charts, you end up getting down to swing trading uh, because like there's more action. you know. And, and you know, I started as a teenager, so your only goal is action. Like You want to make money, but you want to have fun with you and you want to trade. And so that my first job uh, that I got hired at university was as a market maker and day trader. And it was great, but you know, uh, AI is here. Right? Everyone thinks AI is new. Generative AI is pretty new, uh, but AI is not new in the stock market. So I'm, I was there. I started uh, trading on the desk before HFT and Algo started. And I remember when they, they began. And so uh, it, the shorter you, you, sh you shrink your time frame, 
the more powerful computers are against you. So if, for example, if floor and decor is going to go on uh, a nine month rally, well, I mean, like you, you have plenty of time to buy that stock, but if, if you're like day trading for a 40 cent move, uh, and I won't get into all the mechanics of technically, um, which the, the speed of light has an impact of how quick you, your order gets to specific exchanges and how it gets split up. Uh, well, the guy with like a $2 billion budget for technology who has microwave tire, towers, co-locations and the servers and, you know, spe specifically built fiber optic networks right down to, to, to optimize the bouncing of the speed of light within the glass, within those cables, you're not going to be first when you want to buy that thousand shares. So I, most guys I knew day trading, uh, the style we were doing, which was kind of market making, uh, their profits were eroded. I was lucky, I, you know, I was effective, so I was good for many years. But the kind of the writing was on the wall where like, hey, if I really want to keep scaling, it's kind of hard when your adversary, your, your adversary is the terminator. Uh, so because I built enough capital and I always loved growth investing, I had always done it in conjunction. Uh, I thought it was, the, it was going to be the best way to kind of compound my money. And also I found it more intellectually stimulating. Um, and so that's the why I ultimately I kind of made that that drift over. Um, you know, also with time, like when you're like 21, you want to just like live in front of your screen and like not get up. I remember having like 400 orders open and like having to run to get a glass of water and back. I know I'm not an old guy, but you know, like at 37, it's like, it's nice to be able to sometimes like take a five minute walk without worrying about getting filled on like 400 orders. So like part of it is lifestyle as well, that you kind of, um, that changes with time, I would say. Yeah, perfect. Uh, Matt, this has been really great. Uh, as always, um, any last bits of advice for traders out there to, um, you know, analyze the environment uh, and also make the most of uh, a nice new trend if we do get one? Yeah, so I would just really say, um, like, take a moment and stop and, and think about this as a business. And then think about, like, what's the best environment for your business? So, if, if, for example, if you sell toys, you're going to be, like, the best entrepreneur ever in December, in November. But then in January, if you're, like, asking yourself, why am I such a loser that I can't sell any toys? Well, you're not a loser. So at, in this business, unlike a lot of other businesses, you have your P&L, like, flashing at you all the time in your account. And so there's a lot of psychological pressures I think you can minimize that by thinking of this as a business and thinking of context and environment. And um, it's not to kind of rationalize under performance, but to understand what's going right to what's going wrong, just like any business person will analyze their business because being able to kind of execute with a clear mind and being calm is like 90% of the battle. I mean, most of, you'll see what most successful investors do. They look at bar charts, they look at fundamentals. And on the surfaces, like that's pretty simple. Well, how come nobody can pull it off? And then some guys make like billions of dollars. Well, like there's, 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 there's a real same thing like with baseball. You know, like simple to hit a ball with a bat. Well, why does do some people get paid twenty million dollars a year to do it, and some people have to pay to go play in a league? You know, being exceptional at something is important, and part of being exceptional is knowing when to do it, when to do it a lot, when to do it really amazing, and when to kind of back off. And that's what makes this a little bit unique. And to to execute well. You need the right mindset and to have the right mindset, you need to understand your system and the environment and the context. So my, my problem was I would always jump from tool to tool to be better with my tools. And when I kind of stopped to kind of take a breath and look at like the overall arching process that I'm putting together more like a businessman, I find psychologically it kind of calm me and help me to kind of progress and improve. So like take a step back uh, and and look at it from a business angle instead of like just a technical angle or a fundamental angle or a strategy angle. Look at it like a business person. And I think you'll get new insights that you didn't have before. Yeah, I think that's really helpful. And just to use another analogy, you know, if you're running uh, a sports apparel store, you're going to sell bathing suits in July and you're going to sell, uh, you know, winter jackets in, in December. It's just, it's just, it's a strategy that fits the context. So I, I think, you know, I, I think that's a great way to think about it, Matt. So thank you so much once again for your presentation. Uh, hopefully everybody enjoyed it. If you did, uh, make sure to leave a like down below, subscribe to the channel, uh, check out Matt. Uh, Matt, once again, where can people learn more from you and, and reach out to you uh, if they have any questions or want to, more, want to learn more about your style? Sure. Yeah, it's my website, carusoinsights.com. Um, there's also on, on YouTube, I have a YouTube channel that I, I try. I'm not as consistent as you are, Richard. I try when I can to make some videos so you can look up Caruso Insights or Matt Caruso on YouTube. And of course, Twitter, I tweet pretty often at the trader underscore M Caruso. Yeah, perfect. And also for anybody who hasn't seen it, I highly recommend watching Matt's presentation from last year as well. Uh, we'll probably link that uh, in the description whenever this gets posted. Uh, but yeah, thanks again, Matt, so much. Uh, thanks for everybody watching your questions.